Hello, you're listening to an interview with Congressman Rick Saccone from Episode 15 of the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. Like and subscribe to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play, and follow us at Catholic Vote on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. And now I have the honor of sitting down with Representative Rick Saccone, who recently announced he will seek Tim Murphy's 18th district seat in Pennsylvania. I also should mention up front that we recently produced our endorsement of Mr. Zacone. Thank you very much for joining us, Representative. Thank you. I'm glad to be on. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. It's interesting you open with Merry Christmas. Uh, One of the things that you're best known for is actually your overt Christianity and your defenses of religious liberty. You have a lot of guts. (laughs) <laughs> you mentioned it, it seems in every interview, you bring up your faith and you're totally unashamed of it. Right. I think our religious liberty, as you said, has been under attack. And I think uh, it's our duty and our obligation to stand up and defend that. And, uh, you know, the, the Christian believers and all faith believers actually are kind of afraid to stand up for their faith. And I think uh, we should stand up for God. We shouldn't be afraid to talk about how God is the center of our life and and share that with people. Now, why do you think that is? I mean, I see this very pervasively. And in fact, right now you're running against a Catholic who seems to have less conviction than you. And that seems to be, I think, a problem that seems to be growing. The more pressure there is against religious liberty, the more timidity I see, frankly. It's because the media beats you down if you try to stand up for your faith. The media in general are full of faith-hating people. I, I've come across many of them. Not all of the media is like that, obviously, but there's a, there's a large number of them in the media. And they, they tend to beat you down and, and try to ridicule you if you stand up for your faith. And so we have to we have to push back on that. I, I really feel strongly about doing that. And when I do, I find that your listeners and the people in general out there, they cheer it. And whenever they see me at the Giant Eagle or the post office or wherever I'm at, the department stores, uh, you know, they come up and they tell me, thank you for what you're doing. We're glad you're standing up for our faith. So, you know, someone has to do it and I'm willing to stand up and do that. I think a lot of people tend to look at religious liberty and mistake it as sort of a zero-sum game. And if, you, if you're if you assertive about your Christian faith, it can be harmful to people of other faiths or people who are not, you know, don't adhere to a faith. When in fact, the principle itself is a liberal principle in the classical sense. It's not going to hurt anybody, whereas threats to it, as Mary Eberstadt actually re- recently pointed out in an article called The New Intolerance, if Christians are going to be gone after, eventually, so will anyone else who sticks up against whatever the new version of the uh, political correct stance is supposed to be. Isn't that right? Yes. I mean, I, I, I firmly believe in our First Amendment that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that that applies to everyone of all faiths. Uh, and that's the beauty of America. You can worship God in your own way or, or not worship him at all. And I'm just as willing to stand up for people of other faiths so that they can worship. But I don't want to be ridiculed for me standing up for mine. And that's why I'm sure to stand up and defend our faith wherever I can. Hmm. Now, in your announcement for candidacy and some of the interviews you've given since then, you've, you've even mentioned that you made a, a promise to God to give the glory to God in your successes. You've done some very interesting work in counterintelligence in your military background with the United States Air Force. Do you feel that that was something that led you throughout your career? Sure, both of them. Uh, yes, I, I felt uh, I, I made a covenant with the Lord that I'd always been given credit to winning my previous elections to things that I had done, whether I'd knocked on so many doors or I did this or that. And uh, I felt like the credit should have went to God. And so I promised that from now on, I would give him the first credit, the first fruits of any victories that I may have Hmm. while I'm doing his will. And uh, yes, I come from a background of um, in counterintelligence and counterespionage around the world. I spent a lot of time overseas and in the United States, actually. I was uh, part of a counterterrorism task force for the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles and the 88 Olympics in Seoul and worked against the commandos and, and people trying to infiltrate us. I spent a year in Iraq in both Baghdad and Mosul, mm-hmm. working counterintelligence there and uncovering and people that are trying to infiltrate our bases and, and do us harm there and, and interviewing them and interrogating them and screening them and vetting them. So I have a, a long history of, of working in the counterintelligence area. It's interesting because also after your career with, uh, with the military and sort of interspersed with the work you've done in the military, you have also been a student all your life. I mean, you, you've studied numerous topics and of course, also been a professor. You have a PhD and you've you've actually taught uh, at St. Vincent College, of course, teaching about political science and other topics. What is it that made you return to studying again and again? Because you've, you've left your studies behind, done military work, and then gone back to studying. And you've studied 
every topic, I think, that touches on your career, including, interestingly, actually, you've studied Islam. Yes, I've actually never left studying. I've always studied, even when I was in the military. I was studying. I took night courses. Of course, I finished my bachelor's degree as a part of my military program, a special program that allowed soldiers to, uh, or airmen in my case, to uh, complete their bachelor's degree and then be commissioned as an officer. Both of my master's were done under the auspices of the military. So my uh, master in national security affairs from the Naval Postgraduate School was done as a part of a program to make me a Korean area specialist so that I could go back to Korea and work in counterintelligence there. And my PhD was paid for by the GI Bill mostly. Mm -hmm. So when I finished, I was able to go to school after I got out of the military and retired and finish my PhD and teach at St. Vincent, which I still do teach there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's interesting also what you have studied and what you have found of interest and the principles that you hold dear. Uh, you have passed those on uh, with great success to your own children. You have two, I believe, two sons who have followed in your footsteps and joined in the military as well. Isn't that right? Right. I have two sons. Uh, one is a major active duty Air Force. They're both civil engineers, VMI graduates. My older son, Nick, is a um, major. As I said, he's stationed in Korea right now, Osan Air Base as a civil engineer there. My uh, other son, Matt, younger son, is just one year younger than Nick. He's a captain in the Air National Guard, full-time guardsman in the 171st out in the Pittsburgh International Airport area. Mm -hmm. Also a civil engineer out there. So yes, they're both pursuing careers mm -hmm. in the military. Yeah. So you have a vision for your run that has an interesting relationship with, of course, the success of the Trump administration and the sort of Trump message. How do you think you're going to join in that scene? There's a lot going on in D.C., and of course, the president is, you know, really mixing it up. President Trump was elected on a on a broad agenda, beginning with cutting taxes, cutting government spending, reducing government regulation, appointing conservative Supreme Court justices, repealing and replacing Obamacare, rebuilding our military, taking care of our veterans, uh, helping our law enforcement, enhancing our Second Amendment rights, and also very much of importance is protecting our unborn children, mm. which I think is critical. And President Trump has, has stood up for that. And so that's an agenda that I want to help our president implement because he's getting a lot of pushback from the liberal left in Washington and the bureaucracy itself and the media and academia and special interest groups that are pushing back. And they don't want that. They don't want that agenda implemented. But that is the agenda of the people. That's the agenda of the people that voted him in. It's the agenda that I ran on for the state house in 2010, most of that. And so uh, I, I want to go to Washington and be his reinforcements, be another person down there that can help him to uh, push back on the left and, and help implement that agenda that the people all want us to accomplish. Amen. Now, there's a lot of division right now. Um, you mentioned the, the pressure that seems to come not just from the sort of the official and political left, but from the media as well. Why do you think that pressure is building up and, and what do you think the right approach to it is and what will your approach be once elected? You know, it's funny because I've had over the years that I've been in the state house to try to develop a, and I was in the I worked in the media myself before that. Mm -hmm. And I've had to try to develop a relationship with the media. And uh, again, there are there are plenty of good, honest reporters and I try to deal with them out there. But there are plenty of them that aren't the dishonest media. The president calls them. They have an agenda. It's political. Many of them are basically just working for the Democratic Party or the left. Seven percent of journalists, it was recently discovered and actually reported by CNN, seven percent of journalists are Republicans. That's a pretty low number. Pretty low number. So uh, they're, they're part of that, what he calls the dishonest media. And I see them all the time reporting, you know, they have their own agenda, mischaracterizing the, the message, undermining uh, the, the president's agenda. And he calls them out on it. And uh, that's what I try to do, too. If I if I feel I've been uh, treated unfairly, I call the media out on it. I try to deal with the, the reporters that treat me fairly. Right. They're the ones that I call back when they give me a call. And uh, the ones that don't, uh, I, I try to call them out through other ways. And now we have another means. We have we have social media that we can, we can go out and, and call them out on this and, and shame them and show the people that they're not being honest in what they're reporting. It's very important uh, that the media is an important part of our society and they hold government accountable. And I want them to do that. But they have to be fair and honest. And when they're not, when they're agenda driven, then it's uh, it upsets the whole balance uh, of our government and our country. And uh, we have to make sure that they're they're, they, you know, they're always complaining about uh, the government and how dishonest it is. And in many cases, they're right. 
but they're in many cases they're just as dishonest. And we have to, they have to be just as accountable as people in government do. Yeah. Now, and also onlookers, onlookers and voters, potential voters should be aware of that. In light of all of that, what would your advice be to potential supporters of you who are looking on at the upcoming battles and and what can they do to support you and also to make sure that they're getting an accurate view of your uh, campaign and your work? Yeah, I would encourage them to learn about me. Go to my webpage, uh, look at my record, go to my official webpage as well as my campaign webpage, my personal webpage, and learn about my background so that they know and they'll see when the media, I mean, a lot of people I see go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia was put up there by my opponents and they've, they say a lot of uh, inaccurate and bad things about me and I can't get it changed because right. they just they don't cooperate when you try to change those things. So go to my social media to find out about me so that when you hear other things, you know, you'll know that there's a, there's another side to that story uh, because the media will misreport, mischaracterize and try to they're going to try to attack me and tear me down because that's what they do. Uh, and so I, I want people to be informed. I have a very strong record. I'm proud of that record. I'm willing to share it and they can they can check it. It's a public record. So I want them to know as much about me as possible. And I'm sure if they do, they will side with me and they will vote me and allow me to represent them in Washington, D.C. Amen. And that's really good advice, uh, folks. Listeners really do do look into this stuff, look at the right sources. And by the way, Catholic Vote, we looked into the right sources. We saw that record. And let me just quote my boss, uh, Brian Birch here, from our endorsement of Rick Saccone. He says, we are proud to stand with Rick Saccone and we encourage Catholics and all voters Send him to Congress. Rick Saccone will be a champion for hardworking families in Pennsylvania. And that is very true. And we are honored to have you. Thank you very much, Rick, for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Well, thanks for listening to this interview from episode 15 of the Catholic Vote Radio Hour. Again, you can like and subscribe to the Catholic Vote Radio Hour on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play. I'm your host, Stephen Harriet. On your mind, will you be?